Okay, so let me first say that the title of this video is a little bit misleading because Guardians of the Galaxy is not trash at all. It's one of the best MCU movies to date. However, the challenge set was to tell me your favourite movie and I'll tell you why it sucks. And this was the movie chosen. So now, I'm going to tell you why this movie is trash, even though it really isn't. Oh, and spoilers. Welcome to the channel, I'm Hayes, I talk movies all day, sometimes I talk about games, so subscribe right now if you want to be entertained, and today, I want to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy, the 2014 sci-fi action comedy that introduced Peter Quill and She-Hulk lights to the MCU. And real quick, before I get into this, remember how everyone got mad at Zoe Saldana for darkening her skin to play Nina Simone? Well, maybe if people took a stand against her doing green phase, that would have never happened. Just saying. Anyway, here's how this works. I'm gonna go through the movie, point out all the dumb things I see, and then at the end, give you my final thoughts. So, Guardian starts off in 1988 summer on Earth, with Grandpa Quill taking eight-year-old Peter to watch his own mother die, and then taking him out of the room when he starts crying. So, what was the point? That just seems unnecessarily cruel. Grandpa could have just given Mama Quill's present to Peter afterwards, instead of potentially traumatizing the kid for life. Anyway, Peter runs outside to cry some more and gets abducted by aliens, and the movie never really answers this, but surely somebody saw that spaceship. It's a big spaceship making a lot of noise. Surely somebody saw something. So is there an easter egg in any other MCU movies of Peter Quill on a missing persons ad or something? Maybe along with possible alien sightings? Because if not, then that's a missed opportunity right there. But also, did the aliens really come to Earth just to take one kid? Well, actually, yeah, they did. We found out later that Yondu and the Ravengers were high to pick him up. But how did they know just one person was going to come running out of the hospital? And why is there only one person outside a hospital. It's a hospital. People are in and out of hospitals all the time. I don't think they actually had a plan. They just got lucky. So now it's 26 years later when Peter has grown up to be an intergalactic space pirate, which I guess is Marvel's way of saying kids whose parents don't play a significant role in their lives are more likely to join gangs. But my question is, where else in the galaxy do they make double A batteries for Walkmans? And no, it wouldn't be the same batteries because alkaline batteries don't last that long even with low usage. Maybe he's using an alternate power source. Okay, but that's not explained in this movie. And even if he has another way to power the Walkman, are we really supposed to believe that he's had that same cassette tape and player for 26 years and the tape never got chewed up in the tape head? Nah. Also, Peter Quill has a cassette tape player built into his spaceship. So again, where did he get that from? Now you might be thinking, maybe he travelled back to Earth. Maybe. But then why would he be asking Peter Parker, the one true Peter by the way, if Footloose is still the greatest movie ever made in Infinity War? He'd already know that it wasn't. Or was he kidnapped, then taken back to Earth to collect some supplies, and then went back to space never to return? He also has a troll doll and various other earthly junk, so maybe he did go back to Terra for a quick grab. But then that still doesn't answer the question. Who knows how to fit a 1980s cassette deck into an alien spacecraft? There's a lot of context missing here. So you Yondu was hired to pick up Quill and deliver him to Quill's deadbeat daddy but never did. So for 26 years he kept hold of the child he was supposed to deliver and Peter's dad never came for him? Because Ego found Quill pretty easy in Guardians 2. So why did Ego wait so long? And no, no I don't buy that whole thing about only after hearing about Peter holding Infinity Stone. Ego is celestial. We're really supposed to believe he had no other way of finding his own son? Come on now. So Ronan is supposed to be this badass bad guy that doesn't care for peace treaties yet he wears now. Nappies? And not even pampers, those are the cheap nappies that cause a bum rash if they don't get washed properly, and they don't look like they've been washed, ever. After Groot tries to put the wrong him in the bank, Peter runs away with the orb. Gamora breaks free and throws a knife at Peter's hand, causing him to drop the orb. Here's the thing, by the time Gamora broke free, Peter was already around the bend with a crowd in between him and Gamora, which means there's no clear line of sight for Gamora to throw the knife at his hand. So can this knife bend mid-flight like the bullets in Wanted? Also, when Peter dropped the orb, it rolled forward and then dropped down. Bear in mind that Peter was already at a distance from Gamora, which means the orb rolled further away from her. Yet, when Gamora jumps down to get it, it's right there. And no, it didn't roll backwards after it dropped. And yeah, I know, aliens, right? I'm just saying, perhaps it would help to explain the general physics of these environments. Also, when Gamora picks up the orb and runs, Peter jumps down and lands right on top of her. So does she just run towards him? Gamora's a bit dumb, isn't it? Now when they get arrested, Roman Day says, Recently, Thanos lent her and her sister Nebula out to Ronan, which leads us to believe that Thanos and Ronan are working together. 
Really? You believe they're working together? If you already know about Thanos lending out his children, then there is no believe about it. They are working together. So here's the thing about Peter Quill. He left Earth at eight years old and has now spent most of his life, including some of his childhood as a space pirate. Yes, he still makes a lot of Earth references. And yeah, maybe it is all stuff from the 80s and earlier, but come on, how much Earth culture can one eight-year-old experience and retain after 26 years of not being on Earth? So is he going back to Earth? More specifically, is he going back to 1980s Earth? Does Peter Quill have the ability to time travel? Considering it's a Marvel movie, that could very well be true. And when they're being led to the prison cells, I get that they have to give us the audience and context so that we could end up liking Gamora. But is it really a good idea for her to be telling a bunch of strangers that she really planned on betraying Ronan? And in front of the guard as well? And after Rocket already told us everyone there is corrupt? Gamora's a bit dumb, isn't it? So apparently a lot of prisoners lost their families to Rodan and his goons which is why everyone was so angry at Gamora. So why didn't they just attack her there and then? According to Rocket, the guards don't care what they do, so they're really just going to stand there shouting and occasionally throwing some food? Gamora should have been killed off in this scene, and had that happened, Thanos would have never got the salt stone. So if you want someone to blame, blame these prisoners for acting like they want smoke? but can't even put the kettle on. Also, I was going to give this prison points for being gender and species inclusive, but how come Gamora gets her own cell and everyone else got to sleep on the floor? By the way, since when was Emperor Palpatine in the MCU? So Thanos referred to Gamora as his favourite daughter, and as we know and as Thanos finds out later, Gamora was never on his side. Also, that bit in Infinity War when Thanos tells Gamora he never taught her to lie, that's why she's so bad at it. Evidently, she's a good enough liar to fool him for 20 however many years it's been, so shouldn't have this been a point for Thanos to reflect on his poor judge of character. Also, that throne looks super uncomfortable, like his butt must be in all kinds of pain. And why would you have a floating throne in the middle of space? Shouldn't he have a house somewhere? What does Thanos do all day? Man don't have a TV or nothing. So when Peter says if you had a black light, the ship would look like a Jackson Pollock painting, I'm guessing that's a reference to ejaculating on the walls. So those alien girls he's been with, did he ski on all of them? Or does he masturbate a lot? I feel like this movie fails to answer important questions. When the four escaped convicts go to nowhere, Drax, Groot and Rocket get into a fight. When stopping the fight, Peter shouts out they have 4 billion units coming to them. Drax lets out they intend on killing Ronan, all in front of a crowd of people that were previously described as outlaws. You know what? They all might be a bit dumb to be honest. Gamora let the Collector kiss her hand, but not too long before that she wouldn't let Peter kiss her. So it seems, Gamora only gives affection to those willing to buy something from her, which means when Drax called her a wench, apparently it wasn't that far from the truth. When Yondu picks up Peter and Gamora, he tells Peter that the Ravagers wanted to eat him and how he stopped them. Peter then replies, 20 years you've been throwing that in my face. But Yondu picked up Peter 26 years ago. So, did Yondu wait 6 years before telling Peter that other Ravagers wanted to eat him? And if that's the case, wouldn't Peter have known that's a lie by the fact that nobody tried to eat him? And why even wait 6 years to tell him that? That's the type of thing you say when you want to manipulate someone, which means Peter didn't need any encouragement to be a criminal for the first 6 years, he was happily stealing for the Ravagers, the same people that kidnapped him from Earth the day his mother died. Peter got the Nova Corps to help them out by sending an unsolicited dick message. I think somebody needs to talk to Peter Quill about the importance of consent. Now when they board the Dark Astro and it turns out it's too dark to see, Groot creates lights by letting out these glowy firefly type things. But it's such a beautiful display of nature that they're all distracted by it, taking precious time away from their mission, but we've already figured out they're all a bit dumb, so... Yondu's weapon of choice is a flying stick, and it's a pretty cool weapon, but are we really supposed to believe that all the time he's used it against large groups, nobody tries to shoot him while a stick is doing its rounds? People make fun of stormtroopers for having bad aim, well at least they try. By the way, they call Ronan, Ronan the Accuser. So does he just accuse people of things? What does he accuse people of doing? And does he have receipts? Because if he doesn't have receipts, then there's no good reason for anyone to take him seriously. He's like the boy who cried wolf. But since people do take him seriously, perhaps the things he accuses them of are actually true. And in that case, Ronan is the real good guy in all of this. Which in turn means Thanos was right. I am inevitable. So Groot grows into a giant stick ball to protect the four other criminals, but it's never explained why this would kill him. In the same movie, he's been chopped up, he's extended his limbs, he's made fireflies come out of his hands. So what specifically is it about being a stick ball that means he dies? There's a lot of context missing here. 
Also, Groot's last words were, we are Groot, which was supposed to be all sad and whatever, but Rocket said that his entire vocabulary is limited to I am and Groot exclusively in that order, so we has no meaning in his language. That's like ending a prayer with a man and a woman. It sounds like the right thing to say, but it's actually just a bit dumb. During a scene where Peter grabs the Infinity Stone and they all start holding hands, Drax grabs Peter's shoulder as if the director told him he's just been beaten up for the last 10 minutes, then had a sudden burst of adrenaline and now has to crawl over to his corner to tag his partner in. It's probably why Batista got that role. It's good to have someone with experience. The film ends with Peter finally opening his mother's present to reveal that she gave him a mixtape without the cassette case cheap ass gift. But one good thing about this movie is, during the post credit scene we get a Howard the Duck cameo which gives just a little hope, just a little bit of hope that one day they might finally make another Howard the Duck movie. It's been too long. It's been way too long. Alright so before I wrap this up, if you liked this movie, check out these movies. They all involve an unlikely band of people adventuring through space, except the Goonies which has an unlikely band of people adventuring through an underground cave. None of them have a man who lays with Askavarian and yet they all still manage to be a better love story than Titanic. Okay so let's talk about Guardians of the Galaxy. Now like I said earlier, I do actually like this movie. Nitpicking aside, it's a pretty solid film. It has a good balance of action, humour and drama. Nothing ever really feels forced or out of place. Well, apart from the 80s cassette player fitted to a spaceship. I mean, yeah sure, it's not that unthinkable that someone in the galaxy knows how to install one, but they definitely raise more than a few questions. And I would actually stand by Peter making all those Earth references as a major oversight. For those of you in your 30s and older, how many things do you remember from when you were 8 years old? And remember in detail, things you haven't seen nor heard of for over 20 years. And in case someone's thinking, ah, but he is part celestial, that could explain his memory. You might be right, but he couldn't even remember the purple lady in a spaceship, so no. Nah. They done goofed up on that one. And that's why I think Guardians of the Galaxy is trash. What do you think? I am Groot or I am Groot? Let me know down below and while you're there be sure to like, subscribe and drop a suggestion if you don't mind.